original texts because these are my translations and I don't claim to be an expert, so you can always check them and challenge them. And I ask you to challenge me if you think that I'm translating wrong. I mean, I mean, that's <laughs> right. There are Jews who alter the words from their contexts in the book, and they say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't think I wanted this one. I wanted Surah 3, There, because it's easier. There are some among them, a reference earlier in the same uh, section to people of the book, who distort the book, that is the scripture, probably, with their tongues, and you would think it's from the book, but it's not from the book, but they say it's from God, but it's not from God. They lie against God, and they know it. The second verse here, in number four, is similar to that in that there's an accusation of the people of the book, in the second one it's Jews directly, who distort their own scripture. What does that mean? What does it mean? I'm not sure what it means, but I can tell you what I think it means. And I think we can kind of get a sense as to what's happening. For those of you who are familiar with early Islamic history, Muhammad was forced out of his hometown of Mecca, and he found refuge in Medina. Medina was a neighboring town, and in Medina there was a very large Jewish community. The Jews were established in Medina. They had schools, they had their community, they had their life. And they were the only monotheists in this town. The rest of the people in, this, in the town, or the set of uh, oases that was Medina, were Arabian polytheists. When Muhammad came to Medina, he did the same thing that he did in Mecca. When he received a revelation from God as a prophet, he went downtown, he sort of stood on the proverbial soapbox, and he began to recite God's words to the community of Medina. So they would listen to the call of God and come and follow the word of God. From the perspective of the establishment of Jews in Medina, he was a cult leader. Now, from the perspective of Muslims, he was a true prophet. From the perspective of an established religion, he was a threat. And the revelations that he recited were different than the revelations that were known to the Jews in Medina. The themes were ma many times identical. The characters were often identical. But from the Jewish perspective, the Jews knew their scripture. They had already been canonized, had been set. It, I'm not even going to question the validity of either the revelation of the Quran or the revelation that the Jews had in their possession. The point is, they were different. Even if they were exactly the same, that they were rendered in different language, they would have felt different. But in more than just a difference in language, they were different. The essence was the same, the messages were very similar, but the wording was different, the stories were different. <coughs> so if you are an established religion, you know your community, and you know your scripture, and you know your tradition, and a new prophet comes into town and begins to recite the word of God as he knows it, and it looks different than your own, as an established, as a person who already knows your religious tradition, you went to religious school, or you grew up in the church, or the synagogue, or the mosque, what are you going to think about the new person? You're going to think that that person isn't a real prophet. Because after all, prophecy is over. There is no more prophecy. Prophecy has been canonized into scripture. It was natural for the Jews to oppose Muhammad. It was natural for Muhammad to be furious with the Jews. Because if you are a prophet, and you know you're receiving the revelation from God, and somebody says, that's not how the revelation really is. How are you going to respond to that? The response is going to be, I know it. It's right. You must have distorted your own tradition in order to embarrass me in public so that I wouldn't be successful. Embarrassing a new religious leader in public is a old and very successful tactic to try to prevent new religious movements from succeeding. I should mention, and I'm about to close now, I just want to kind of set this kind of paradigm. New religious movements emerge in every human generation. It's not just today where there are cults. Every generation where we have historical evidence, we've seen new religious movements emerging into history. They almost always fail. Almost all new religious movements fail. They fail for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons they fail is because establishment religions don't like them to succeed. And so you have built in conflict. So, now that I've sort of given you a, a brief overview, 
I will make the claim, yes, there's anti, I don't know how the word is to use, because everything is so loaded, the terms are so loaded. I don't want to say anti-Semitism. I don't want to say anti-Judaism. I don't want to say, but in the Quran, there is resentment that's directed against Jews. There's resentment that's directed against Christians. There's resentment that's directed against polytheists. It shouldn't be surprising from the academic study of religion that there should be resentment in the Quran. In the New Testament, <coughs> there's resentment directed against Jews. There's resentment directed against Romans. There's, there's resentment directed against pagans. It shouldn't be surprising. There's resentment in the Torah directed against Canaanites and Moabites and Philistines and Egyptians. All of them established communities that were threatening to the emergence of the Israelite monarchy. It's a phenomenon of religion. It's not great, it's not nice, but it's truth, and it's something that we have to deal with. So I, as a Jew, I can say, I can choose as a Jew, I can say, oh, look at all this terrible stuff in the New Testament. It's so anti-Jewish. What kind of a scripture is this? What, this can't be God speaking, being so evil and mean. I can say, the Quran is so anti-Jewish, what kind of scripture is this? But I don't do that. I don't do that because I understand the system, I understand the phenomenon. The difference between the Quran and the New Testament and the Hebrew Bible is that in the Quran there are Christians and Jews who can criticize the Quran. In the New Testament there are Jews who can criticize the New Testament. But in the Torah there are no more of those ancient polytheistic establishment religions who can criticize the Torah. So Jews sometimes get off sort of on saying, oh gosh, you guys are always against us, and we didn't do anything. It is not an issue of doing or not doing, it's simply a phenomenon of religious relationship. And we as modern people, and with this I'm going to close because I'm probably already an hour, 15 minutes. <laughs> we as modern religious people who are living in a pluralistic world in which we must learn to respect the religion of the other. We don't have to agree, we don't have to be believers, but when we have a better sense of why there's this tension that's built into the system, then we can begin to overcome it and we can, we can, we can develop a relationship with our religious brethren of other traditions and engage in common project and in areas in which we have in common religiously and socially and economically in order to make the world a better world. And that's something we need to think about. So that was my kind of setting out.